Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian. I live in America. I'm originally from Canada, but uh, I live over in Colorado in the United States and uh, happy to fill in for our Lamy today. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Postman. I've been at the company now a little over a year and uh, I've actually been using the tool for a long time. I've been in the industry for quite a while, seen, seen a lot of things, uh, mostly backend development, a lot of API work and so on. So I've actually been a user of Postman for a long, long time. And so what I wanted to kind of walk through today is talk a little bit about how is Postman commonly used um, and then how can we sort of look at that from like a tester's perspective or a DevOps perspective and look into different ways that we can automate um, how we can use Postman and what you can set up in Postman. How can we automate that and do things from kind of a DevOps perspective or from a, a like an automation QA tester uh, point of view? Um, so hopefully uh, I've tried sharing my screen. I'm hoping that's coming through okay. Uh, can someone let me know if you can see my screen all right? Let me know that it's sharing properly in uh, in Teams. I've never. Sorry, is it? You can? Okay. All right, great. Um, so I'm in the Postman application. Um, you can use the web browser version or you can use the desktop version. Uh, most of what I'm going to be demoing today is available to free accounts. There are a few things I'll point out uh, kind of as we as we go along where you will need a paid version of an account, but most of what we're going to be doing today you can do on a free account. Um, so most, most uh, people that get started with Postman, they're familiar with using it as kind of an HTTP client for testing out an API. So you've got some kind of URL that you're putting in here. I'm pulling out the host name from a variable, um, but then I can go, I can send that request over and I can get some kind of response back. And that's primarily how a lot of people use Postman. And that's the extent of how much they use Postman is just, I'm gonna try and call this API, I get a response back, all right, cool, that API works. Let me go write that in my code or figure out what we're gonna do. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to go through some of the different scenarios of how you can use Postman at an even deeper level. So we're going to talk about testing. We're going to talk about how to kind of run a series of those tests. And then we're going to look at ways to um, run those from a command line point of view and then get into like a CI CD kind of setup for DevOps. And uh, feel free to ask questions along the way. I'll pay attention to the chat. Um, I've also got the uh, participant panel up as well. So if you've got questions, feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to uh, to take questions kind of as we go as well. Um, so once we get a structure of data back, one thing that you can commonly do in here is you can validate the data that actually comes back. Um, you can also validate things like the status code that we see here, um, you know, maybe how long it took. We have a number of code snippets here on the on the side that we can actually activate. So I'm going to pull this down a little bit. And we've got a whole bunch of snippets uh, that we can do in here. So typically, when when you first come into, uh, into Postman, you would see like the query parameters that you might send as part of a GET request. Or if you're doing like a post, for example, you might be looking at the body view where you can see the data that you're going to pass. Um, I'm a big fan of really silly dad jokes. So this is one of my favorites. Um, but uh, what we're going to be spending our time in today is actually this testing area here in the application. And this is basically going to be a block of JavaScript code that executes once the response comes back. You can also write some JavaScript code that goes in the pre-request. And that JavaScript will execute before this URL actually gets called. And then the test code gets run afterward. So if you need to go set something up um, or if you need to go get like an authentication token, for example, you could do that as part of a pre-request script and then it'll go get that token and then it'll go call your URL and then it'll execute any test code afterward. We're primarily gonna stick with the test code today. We're not gonna worry too much about pre-request scripts. So we've got all these snippets that you can kind of look through here. And uh, I'm just going to pull one in and say, you know, I expect that when I call a post request, that maybe I get a 200 or maybe I get a 201 back. Um, and so then you can start building up an expectation in here. So if I send this over, um, actually on the wrong server over here, let's go to this one, let's see if this will work. Yeah, there we go. So, um, so I'm able to send the request over. 
Now this post actually came back with a 200 and I said, I expected to get a 201 in return. So I can see here in the interface that that test actually failed. And like most testing uh, that you would do in software, you can list a whole bunch of these tests at, all in one shot. And as soon as one line fails, it will stop running any remaining lines of code. There's no point running any other point or any other lines of code if we've failed at a, at a specific point. Um, and so we can change this back and just say, uh, I'm going to change my string up here and say that the status code is good. So we expect to get back a 200. And now we can actually start kind of dissecting what comes back in this response. And there's lots, again, there's lots of these little snippets in here that we can look at. Uh, we can say, you know, I want to look at some of the JSON data and I want to make sure that, you know, something in here actually has a value. So we can come in here and we can say, okay, I want to unpack that JSON data. Um, and I'm going to expect that um, my JSON data that I unpack, it's going to basically take the, the big string that comes in, it's going to unpack that JSON and put it into a data structure um, of an object in this case for JavaScript. And I'm going to expect that I've got a key in here called data. And that data has an attribute called name. And I'm going to expect that, uh, that length to be greater than something. So I expect that to be greater than, uh, we'll say 10 bytes. So one of the things that Postman has built into their library is the ChiJS testing software library package. Um, and so we have all of these cool expectations and assertions that we can run as test code. Um, so, you know, your developers can come in, they can write this stuff. If you're QA, you're going to be really familiar with this. And this is going to be more of what we call behavior driven testing because it's the behavior of the API. You're testing the behavior of actually what's going on. It wouldn't be so much uh, like unit testing. Unit testing would be done on the API side for the developers who are actually building the API. This is more the behavior of, you know, once I, once that API is actually built, and we actually go call that API. How do we handle that response and so on? So if I send this over, we can see that the test result is now one of one, which means all of our test code is succeeding so far. And so all we've done here is we've unpacked our response and say that within that body of the response, I expect to see data. The data has an attribute called name and that the length of that value is greater than 10, 10 bytes. Um, so this is a pretty simplistic uh, way of setting this up, but you can have multiple tests in here as well. Um, you can also test for error conditions and things like that. So lots of little samples in here that you can kind of look at to get some inspiration about what you want to do. Um, let's see. Um, so once you set up a number of these tests, so I'm going to go through and I'm just going to add, uh, I'm going to add some of this to our get request as well. Now this test failed because we don't have this same structure here. In this case, we have uh, args. In this case, we had like a parameter called param1, and we expect that to be a length greater than 10. Now this one would also fail because this is only six bytes long. So I'm going to send that over. Sure enough, it still fails. And if I say I want that to be longer than say, five bytes, send that over, and now that one is passing. So you can come in, and, and most people in Postman that use Postman, they'll build what we call a collection, which is kind of what we're looking at here in, in the workspace. And within that collection, you're adding a whole bunch of requests to actually go call an API. Um, so I just kind of wanted to level set a little bit just so that everyone's kind of at the same point uh, of, of how most people get started with Postman. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save these bits of work here in the collection. That just synchronizes it with the Postman cloud. Um, now that we have these tests, it's a, it's a little bit of a manual effort to go through and click on a request, hit send, check to see the test result, go to the next request, hit send, look at the test result to make sure that everything is working. And so what we've built is a way that you can actually run a whole series of these tests all in one shot. So by clicking on the collection here at the very top level, we see that there's a run button up here in the top right corner of the user interface. And this is our what we call a collection runner. 
Inside of here, you can tell it which of those requests you actually want to go call. And then you can tell it like how many times you want to run it. Do you want to delay in between? If you, um, if you set up your tests in a way that you can receive uh, some CSV data or some JSON data, then you can upload a file ahead of time. Um, and you can kind of inject that data into your tests if you want to. Um, so we're just going to run this manually right now. We're just going to leave this kind of as is. And we're going to go ahead and run this as our collection. And so what we see here is it used uh, an environment in here that I've got called Turing. It ran one iteration. It took a, you know, just under two seconds to run everything. Two of those requests had tests. And the average response time was about 200 milliseconds. So you get a pretty nice report coming back here of all the different endpoints. And then the ones that had tests, we can see here that those tests passed. Now, coming in here and clicking on this run button, uh, there is a limit to how many times, oops, it's asking me to log back in for some reason. Um, there is a limit to how much you can manually run this. And so we came up with some even more in-depth automation. Um, and so we're going to look at how to actually run this collection from a command line. So I'm actually going to stop sharing this in a moment, but I'm going to go grab two pieces of information that we need to actually run this on the command line. Um, and then you'll get to see, you know, if, if you're into kind of the DevOps realm or into kind of an automation kind of thing, you'll see where I'm going with this here in a moment. Um, in order to run this at a command line, I need two pieces of information. Um, because of how I've set up calling these, uh, these URLs, I've actually uh, got this in a variable. I've got my, my host name and maybe a port number and so on. I've actually got that coming from an environment. And so I need to go get an ID value for that environment. And then I need to get the ID value for the collection that I actually want to run. Um, and these are going to be UUID values. Um, so I'm going to start with the collection. If I click on the collection itself, over here in the context bar, there's a little information icon. I'm going to click on that. And inside here, we see this UUID value, which is an ID of my collection. So I'm just going to copy these over to uh, just a notepad for a moment so that I can use these again in, uh, in the command line. Next thing I'm going to do is go do the same thing for my environment. So inside of my Turing environment, I've got these URLs set up for going and calling uh, a Spotify GraphQL endpoint for some of my endpoints. And then I've got this Postman Echo server that we use for the RESTful endpoints. And these are just example uh, servers that we, that we use to kind of teach about APIs. But I'm going to need this environment to work, because if I just tell my command line client to go run the collection, it's not going to know how to resolve this variable that I have here for the address. Um, and using a variable like this is a good way of sort of deduplicating the amount of effort that you would put into these kinds of things. So I also need to grab the ID value of this environment. So same thing over here on the right context bar. We've got that information icon. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to copy this UUID uh, as well. We actually have two different command line tools that you can use. The one that we've had around the longest is called Newman. And uh, Newman was actually named after the Seinfeld character of the, of the postal carrier. Um, but uh, last fall, when we came out with version 10 of Postman, we actually released a new command line interface called Postman CLI. And Postman CLI is built by us. It's digitally signed by us as Postman. Um, and and you know we build the features into that that we want. Newman is still kind of community driven. And so we take a lot of feedback from community. And, and there's a lot of uh, community contributors to the Newman project. Uh, we do consider that one open source, where the Postman CLI is going to be a closed source version. Um, and it allows us to kind of uh, adapt a little bit quicker to the kinds of things that we want to be building. So we're not deprecating Newman at all. Uh, we actually started the Newman project. We open sourced it. And the community is still a big part of that for us. Um, but in order to use the Postman CLI, the last thing that I actually need to get from here is actually an API key. So if you're logged in to Postman and doing this kind of stuff, you can go down here to your settings. So you click on your profile icon, you go to settings. And inside of here, you'll have an area called API keys. And these are all going to be masked. So I'm not worried about any of you seeing these right now. Um, but I made a new API key specifically for this talk. And you can see here that it's valid. You can always come in and you can disable them. You can generate new keys and so on. So I've already actually got that copied. 
into uh, into what I need over here. So I'm going to stop sharing my Postman screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a terminal screen instead. So let me go grab that here real quick. All right, let me increase that font size a little bit. So we have the Postman CLI now. And we have uh, a handful of things that we can do here. We can log in, we can log out, we can tell it to do something with a collection. And if you're an enterprise level user, uh, we also do API linting for both governance rules as well as uh, security rules. Um, and so that's something that we wanted to make available to our enterprise customers. Um, but like I said, most of what I want to demo today is going to be available on a free plan. So we're going to focus on just the collection uh, work that we can do here. So um, if you do a Postman login, um, I'm going to override what's currently there. And it's going to ask me for an API key. So I'm going to go grab that API key, and I'm going to paste it in here. And one of the main differences between the Postman CLI and the Newman command line interface is that by having this API key available to the Postman CLI, we can use those ID values that I copied a moment ago um, to say, go get this collection or go get, uh, uh, go get this environment. With Newman, you either have to export that collection as a file and then run that file, or you have to use your API key to go fetch it every time. And you have to actually put the API key as part of this really long URL to actually go fetch things. Um, and it, it becomes a very, very long command line. Um, and if you're doing any sort of automation with that, tracking things inside of uh, environment variables can be a little tricky. Um, you know, once once you get it set up, it's not tricky, but you know, making sure that everything is in the right place can uh, can be a little uh, a little harder to read because it's such a long command that you have to run on the command line. So, what we wanted to do is simplify that a little bit with the Postman CLI. So, what I can do here is I can say I want to do a collection run. So this is our collection runner. And the first thing I need to give it is the ID value of the collection. So I'm going to go paste that in here. And then we have to tell it the environment that we're going to use. So we use dash E. And then I need to paste in that environment ID that I copied earlier as well. And this is all we need for the Postman CLI now, is we can just paste in these UUID values. And what this is going to do is it's going to go fetch that collection on the, on the fly. Um, it's going to go use my Postman API key to go fetch my collection. And then it's going to go and it's going to run those tests. So we can see it ran one iteration. There were six requests in there, a total of eight test scripts. Um, there were two assertions, and one of those failed. And so now we can actually go try to figure out what happened. There was something in the post request. Uh, we expected a 200, but for some reason, we got a 404. Um, and so this will allow us to now go run this at a command line uh, interface. I'm not sure why that one's coming up with a 404. It worked. Uh, it worked in the main interface. Um, but what this will allow us to do is is uh, we can also customize what these reports are, and we've got lots and lots of documentation uh, around how to sort of customize the reports that you want to build here. These collection runs also end up back in Postman as well, so we can go back to Postman and we can see that these things were actually run. Um, so I'm going to stop using the terminal at this point, but I wanted to give you kind of a, a brief glimpse at like how these can be run at a command line level. Um, and again, if you're kind of in the DevOps realm and you're thinking about automation, you can probably guess where this is going to head uh, as we get into like CI, CD pipelines and so on. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to reshare my Postman screen. And I'm going to go back to my workspace. Um, cool. So the other way that we can automate this uh, or start to automate this is using something called a monitor. And a monitor is, is basically kind of our word for a cron job within Postman. So we basically set up like a, a timed event that happens within the Postman cloud to go run your collection. Um, so I'm actually going to go run uh these restful endpoints again because for some reason one of them was failing i'm curious why that was coming back with a 404 so i need to make sure i choose my environment let me go run that again 
No, it passed here. So I'm not sure why that one failed on the uh, on the command line, but I'm not gonna not gonna spend time debugging it right now. Um, so all of these worked okay. Um, but what I want to do is I want to go set up a monitor. So the you can go through monitors and you can say I want to create a monitor and you can go through and manually uh, enter a bunch of information. But we actually have a shorter way of doing that. From the collections that you have here, we can actually click on that collection and where you see the three dots. You can click on that to get the submenu, and one of the items in here is to monitor the collection. So again, a Postman monitor is basically our version of a cron job. You can give it a name if you like. Um, it's already filled in the collection. The collection tag is like, uh, you can think of this like a revision control. Um, and then which environment we want to use. So I'm going to choose that environment. And then a data file. So again, if your tests are set up in a way that you can accept a JSON or a CSV file, you can upload that here. And what, what it will do is it will actually call the request for each of the lines in those CSV files. Lots of documentation around that. So I'm not going to demo that right now. Uh, but this is where you can get into how frequently you want to run this as a monitor. So you can do a weekly timer if you want to go into a daily granularity. And you can say, I want to run it every Monday through Friday, or I want to run it only on Fridays. If you set an hourly timer, it will say every hour, every two hours, every 12 hours, and so on. There's lots of options in here. Or if you go down to the minute level, then you can say, you know, every, run this collection every five minutes or every 30 minutes. This basically gives you a lot more confidence that your API is actually working. And as soon as some of those tests start to fail, you'll get email notifications. And so you can uh, set up automation around, you know, if this particular email address gets something from Postman, send it over to PagerDuty or something like that to alert somebody that something broke. Um, and so you can set this up as you're monitoring here. You can set up additional emails as well. You can also tell it to stop emailing you if, uh, if you get a, a number of failures so that you're not like overloading some other third-party system. If you were to forward this on to something like a PagerDuty, um, you can tell it to time out or to sort of stop sending those notifications after a while. Um, but basically, you, you create the monitor in here, and it will use whatever timer that you set, and it's going to run that on an automated basis. Now, with a free plan, uh, you do have some amount of free quota for running these monitors. Um, the more of a paid plan that you have at Postman, the more monitoring you can do. Um, and so there will be some limitations in there, but you can get started with monitoring for free. Same thing with the collection runner and going in and, and manually clicking on that run button. Uh, but let's take it a step further. If you were, so this, this is kind of the primary way that people start to use Postman and then gradually getting into the more advanced testing and try to see like, how can we automate that testing? You know, using the command line tool is great. Um, but what else can we do with Postman? Well, you can actually go design your API right inside of Postman. Um, and so if your team already has an open API specification or a Swagger uh, specification, you can import those directly into Postman. And you can work on them here. We have a little bit of like uh, scanning and syntax checking and things like that built into the application. Um, and so you can import those. If you're on an enterprise plan, you can also synchronize this with a GitHub repository or a Bitbucket repository. We've got some videos about how to synchronize those. Um, but again, those are only available for enterprise customers. Um, but if you put your uh, if you put your open API specification in here, we've actually got a handful of other really neat things that can uh, that can happen. So if we go all the way up to the top level here, uh, one thing that we've got over here on the right side is a code generator. So if your team knows how to build an open API spec or a Swagger spec, but they haven't actually written any code yet, um, sorry, I guess the, the account that I'm logged in right now doesn't have this, but um, if you have the open API specification in here, we'll generate Java code, uh, Python code, Go, or JavaScript with node.js. Um, and we'll we'll start to generate kind of a, a kind of a basic framework or scaffold of your API. Um, I think Python uses the Flask library, and I think for Java it uses the Spring framework. Um, and so that's one way that you can kind of get started in there. Um, but what I want to show you here is how we can kind of take this automation kind of to the next sort of stage, and 
that's going to be this test and automation link here. So the testing and automation, this is where we can actually set up all kinds of CI CD pipelines. Um, again, you can you can get into uh, synchronizing this with your code repository as well. But we've been adding more and more, uh, you know, uh, integration partners in here. We actually just added last fall. We actually, or uh, yeah, last fall, we actually added Azure pipelines in here as well. So if you're familiar with using Azure and you want to start adding this uh, in into uh, your, your CI CD environment, what we'll do is we'll take your uh, the API that you design and we'll actually give you the instructions that you need to actually get this sort of working with Azure pipeline. So it'll go through and it'll it'll go through kind of an OAuth uh, sort of step here, which I've already done. Uh, so when we get come back to Postman, uh, now my Azure setup with the account that I used with Azure, I didn't have an organization or a repository set up. Um, but if you've already got those, then these drop downs would populate because of that OAuth key. Uh, these would actually populate for you. And then you could go through and you could connect uh, this API to your Azure pipelines. Um, if we back up and we do something like a circle CI, uh, yeah, let's do circle CI. Um, it would be the same sort of thing here. You enter your API key for circle CI, and then it would be able to go fetch the list of projects at circle CI. And then anytime you make a change to your API, it'll actually go run your CI CD pipeline for you. Um, so it's a very handy way of keeping these things synchronized where you can do the work, like you can initiate the work inside of Postman or you can synchronize those API uh, specification files over like a GitHub repository, for example. And then if you do make a change inside of Postman, that can then sort of have this trickle effect of, you know, I made a change, so go run the CI CD. Um, and then with the CI CD, um, if I had any of these actually set up for you, you'd be able to see the monitoring in here of when they actually ran. Um, so that's the other nice thing about uh, setting up the CI/CD in here is you'll actually be able to see when those CI/CD uh, things actually executed, and you can actually manually uh, execute the CI/CD pipeline from within Postman as well because of those integrations uh, that we have with these partners. Um, so if you set up, you know, Circle CI or GitHub Actions or whatever, you can say like, "Go start that CI/CD pipeline with whatever the latest version is," and it'll actually go run all that for you. So I wanted to kind of give that deeper sort of look into what Postman is capable of um, as far as like kind of those, you know, starting with kind of the basic features of how do we get started with testing and then start getting into, okay, now how do we do that as command line? And then how do we do that as, you know, as an API designer? From the collection level as well, we can also get into some of those integrations. Um, trying to remember how to get into that from here. Now we'll, we'll do that another time. Um, but there's also a way that uh, that will actually give you the uh, the Circle CI or the the Jenkins or the Travis CI will actually give you the uh, the configuration for that, um, so that you can actually see like what what data do I need to put in my you know Circle CI.yaml file to actually go download the Postman client. Uh, go set my API key in an environment variable and then like grab your collection IDs and so on. Um, so lots of lots of things that you can do inside of here. If you um, if you are not so much on the programming side of it, the other thing that uh, just got released into general availability is what we call flows. And this will be the last thing I, that I demo here. But basically what we would allow you to do from here is um, it's kind of a visual programming tool where you can say, I want to go send a request. And then you pick your environment from here. I'm going to go call Turing. And I'm going to pick which of those environments I want to call. Uh, so we're going to do the example postman calls, rest, and I'm going to call my get endpoint. And then, you know, if that succeeds, I want to go do a thing. If it fails, I want to go do a thing. Uh, you know, maybe I want to log what happened if it didn't work. Um, but if it did succeed, I want to, you know, maybe I want to take the output of that parse some information about it, and then pass that as input to another request. And so this gives you a way to kind of visually plan out uh, the API interactions that you might build out. And it's a really nice kind of drag and drop tool. And this is really helpful for folks who are not programmers that don't know how to go in and write the JavaScript tests, but they still want to interact with your API. And so by having these things in a collection, now people can come in and they can build a more visual workflow 
of I want to call this API endpoint and I want to take the output from that. I want to parse it in this way, or I want to go find some information. We've actually built some AI into into here where you can say like, um, let's say we're grabbing all of the uh, all the users out of our system with their addresses, and we can say go find everyone who lives in Coventry, England. Um, like you can literally type that in as a as a query, and it'll export only the users who have that address matching kind of thing. So we we've got some uh, some cool AI built into that, and then you can take that and you know pass that in as input into another request, for example. So there's a lot of really neat tooling in here if you want more of a visual tool as opposed to sitting down and trying to parse this stuff out and trying to do regular expressions or anything like that. Uh, we've actually built uh, all the AI stuff directly into this tool that we call Flows. Um, now Flows, like you can come in here and you can run the flow and it'll, it'll show you that it worked and, and so on, but um, there's no way to run a flow from the command line. Uh, we've actually had that requested as a feature. I don't know if, the, if that's actually on the on the roadmap or not, but um, but we've had some people request like if I build out this complex flow, can we actually run that like a collection runner? Um, but I don't know if we have a, a status on that. Um, but the the primary use case that we see in Postman is people setting up a lot of these requests and then coming in and running that collection runner either manually or using a monitor where we're just going to run that for you. You know periodically and you'll be able to see um, uh, kind of a history of when those ran and then from there kind of taking it to the step of doing a command line interface where you can run these things at a command line and then there's a lot of power in the command line uh, you know as far as parsing out those reports and parsing out the data that comes back to know if something failed or not maybe maybe something failed but you expect it to fail uh, like maybe like you want to check for failure uh, conditions and so on. So you can kind of go through and build out your own custom reports about, you know, I expect this one to fail, I expect this one to pass. And if all of that works, then I know everything's okay. And I, you know, you can kind of write your own shell scripting around that for whatever kind of DevOps uh, automation that you want to do. Uh, I'm happy to hang out and answer questions. Um, if there's anything that I can answer for you, uh, if you want me to uh, dive in a little bit deeper on anything, uh, please let me know. Um, I'm also available on uh, on Twitter as well. I use Ian Douglas 736 as my username. Um, and so you're welcome to uh, reach out to me or just reach out to get Postman on Twitter and uh, and we're happy to answer questions there as well. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't think of a question, Ian. Uh, that was that was very good, no though. Thank you very much for that. No worries. Cool. Well, I'll I'll uh, I'll stay on the call uh, for a little while, and uh, and uh, you know I'm looking forward to hearing what Peter's going to share with us. Uh, but yeah, if you do have questions, uh, please do reach out to me. I'm Ian Douglas at Postman.com. If you want to just email questions as well, I'm happy to uh, to do that. We've also got a community forum where you can post questions if you're getting into Postman and you got questions about how to use something. We've got a great community forum you can reach out to as well. Cool. Thanks for having me today. All right. Thanks very much, Ian. It's awesome. All right. Um, thanks, Ian. That's um, the next thing on the bill is uh, Peter. I can see him getting. <laughs> I can see him getting ready there now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, we'll hand over hand over to uh, to Peter to talk about Microsoft AI. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Good to have a mention of AI in the last talk as well. So uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen. And that's being yes, shared. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Okay, so I'm Peter Bull, and you can find me on Twitter. I'm Rogue Planetoid, and I currently work for Bead Gaming. And this is my talk about Microsoft and AI. So first of all, let's talk about uh, search with Bing. So if you don't know, uh, Bing is a search engine from Microsoft. You can find it at bing.com. It was actually first launched in 2009, although they did have a search product before then. There was Windows Live Search along with MSN Search. You can also, when you're searching on Bing, you can actually earn Microsoft rewards. So that can like points every time you search. So you can redeem those for like gift cards for quite a lot of things for like Xbox and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, you can get some free stuff if you search on there too. 
Uh, recently, Satya Nadella, who's the chairman and CEO of Microsoft, recently stated that AI will fundamentally change every software category, starting with the largest category of all, search. So what we've seen recently is AI is providing compelling content discovery and creation. Uh, ChatGPT was launched by OpenAI near the end of 2022. And it's proven pretty popular. It's pretty much changed the landscape as we know it of content creation and discovery. And it allows it to produce human-like responses from a variety of prompts using its massive data set. Uh, ChatGPT can get answers to questions. It can even create original content all from human prompts. ChatGPT can also remember what was said in a conversation. So it can you can clarify or get any corrections, but it will reject anything that it deems inappropriate. A limitation of ChatGPT is that it has a limited knowledge of events after 2021, and it can potentially generate incorrect information, uh, biased instructions, or potentially even harmful content as well. So ChatGPT demonstrates the power of AI uh, in an easy to use way on a wide variety of topics. It can even explain what it what it actually is itself, which is pretty cool. So ChatGPT is basically part of a category of AI applications known as generative AI. They don't offer any web search capabilities themselves, but they do allow you to generate some content. So there are others out there generating other content, such as Jasper, Stability AI, and some others as well. You've also got on the other side of that, you've got search engines as well. So you'll have search engines like Bing, uh, Google, and then there are also search products built into other services like Amazon and YouTube for finding products and videos. So what if you could get the best of both worlds with generative AI and search? That's where Bing comes in again. So Bing basically brings together the best of generative AI powered by GPT-4, which is the latest uh, model from OpenAI, which but designed for search and also allowing search to be augmented with AI. So how does that actually work? So Prometheus from Microsoft is a proprietary collection of capabilities and technologies that use GPT-4 from OpenAI. And that provides the latest, and that's providing the latest AI features of Bing. This also provides uh, improved relevance of results, up-to-date information, along with annotated answers and links. There's also increased safety as well, because Microsoft understands that AI isn't just like any other tool or piece of software. It requires principles to make sure it's used ethically and responsibly, which is during the creation of Prometheus was during training and as it's running to make sure that the uh, open AI model is being engaged with more intelligently. So Prometheus leverages the power of Bing and GPT-4 to iter iteratively generate a set of internal queries through the Bing orchestrator to provide accurate and rich answers for a query within a given context of a conversation. So it basically knows what's going on. And then Prometheus selects the required internal queries and uses the respective Bing results to provide the relevant and up-to-date information as the result. And this allows it to answer topical questions and it also helps reduce inaccuracies. And the model itself reasons using the data provided by Bing. So Bing and Prometheus was developed and tested by using the OpenAI GPT-4 model itself, and this allowed any uh, potential risks and potential even illegal activities to be identified from the model. The process of developing Prometheus actually took advantage of the model's ability to be a realistic conversation simulator itself. So thousands of conversations could be uh, iterated through, which were potentially harmful in nature, and that allowed the system to detect how Bing would respond in in return to these in result with these uh, questions that were asked. This also the process itself also allowed Prometheus to be continuously developed with a wide range of different conversations to make sure it was doing the right thing, not only to see if it was doing anything it shouldn't be, but to identify any defects and also allow the system to be updated accordingly. So this effectively allowed for a tight loop of testing, analyzing and improvement of the system and actually led to significant improvements from the initial implementation, along with assessing how current and timely the information that was being returned from the system. So what does this actually mean? So this actually delivers a chat with Bing, 
that basically allows you to get the complete answers you're looking for. Chat with Bing allows you to ask complex questions and get better answers by providing more details, along with clarity and ideas, with results that include citations and links that allow you to act on any responses. You can even get creative inspiration. So basically this allows you to have the, the benefits of generative AI combined with the power of search. And for the demo I'm going to do a bit later, so let's, you can think about a few things I could ask Bing chat for. So have a think of a few things I'll ask, I'll ask it a bit later. So chat with Bing supports three conversation styles at the moment. So they can be more creative, where responses are a bit more original, a bit more imaginative, creating a bit of surprise or even entertainment. Uh, there's more balanced, which is kind of like the average one. That's where responses are a bit more reasonable, a bit more coherent. And there's also some accuracy, a bit more balanced accuracy there from the uh, from the agent. Uh, you can also have more precise answers as well. So those are factual and concise, and those prioritize accuracy and relevancy in any responses. So from your chat conversations, you can basically pick the one that's right for you. And you can even swap to a different one and ask the same question and see what different response you get. So chat with Bing allows you to ask any question, such as to explain the new Bing itself and any information it provides, contains any links, so you can see where it's getting its information from. And if there's anything you're not sure of or you need further details, you can also use those links as well. Uh, the new Bing is also integrated in other parts of the experience from Microsoft. So in the taskbar search in Windows 11, you can also access the new Bing in Windows. So basically it's integrated in the Windows taskbar search, so you can effectively access the world's information or generate content straight from the taskbar in Windows itself. Bing is also integrated with Skype, where you can basically get any answers, creative ideas, or summaries uh, straight from chat. So Bing and Skype can provide helpful answers to your questions, whether you just need a quick answer or something a bit more in depth, or it can even just generate ideas or you can even just have fun with it as well. So Microsoft Edge also integrates the features of the AI, uh, the AI features of Bing, and those are provided through the Discover feature in the sidebar. So if you've got the latest version of Edge, you might have seen this already. So basically Microsoft Edge, if you don't know, is a web browser from Microsoft. You can get it from microsoft.com forward slash Edge. And it uses the Chromium engine uh, from Google uh, to render content and is also fully extensible with browser extensions and compatible with many of the ones from their browser as well. So Microsoft Edge integrates with new Bing using the Discover option. You can find that in the sidebar on the top right, and that basically allows you to chat anywhere you are on the web. It's also aware of the content or page that you're currently looking at as well. So you can ask it to summarize the page you're on, or if you're viewing, say, a PDF, you can summarize that as well, all from the sidebar. The, the option in the sidebar also allows you to compose content as well. So Microsoft Edge has Compose in Discover, and that allows you to generate content. So you can choose different tones, such as professional, casual, enthusiastic, informational, or even funny. Then you can select a format. You can have a, just a paragraph, or you can have an email, a blog post, a list of ideas, and that can either be a short uh, piece of content, medium piece of content, or a long piece of content. It's up to you. So Compose is a quick and simple way to generate and edit draft content to any website and then just copy it straight into uh, to the website itself, or you can copy it to the clipboard. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So if anyone wants to think of anything I can ask, uh, then that would be good. So at the moment I'm showing a uh, chat GPT. So chat GPT is kind of like the 
the predecessor to the chat with Bing. So I can ask it a question and then we can ask the same question in Bing chat or a different one. It's entirely up to you. So you can po post some suggestions in the chat. And if I don't get anything, I'll just I'll just uh, make up some stuff myself. So I'll give you give you a minute or so to think of something. Then we'll we'll have a go. Has anyone actually used the uh, chat GPT before? Or any any of the kind of uh, generative agents? I've used it a little bit. I've seen uh, more horror stories than than. <laughs> OK, well, we've not got anything. Let's let's try some. Let's get let's get it to explain itself. So what is chat GPT? We'll just ask start simple. So straight away is answering the question about itself. And then yeah, so if you've seen this kind of thing before, it's pretty good at explaining that, but it won't. The one thing it won't tell me is where to get that information from. There's no links or anything like that. It is not telling me where to go for that. So I could ask it uh, what is chats with Bing. See if it knows about that. Now it does have some knowledge of stuff after 2021. So it has got has got so it is telling me about that. Again, it's not giving me any links or anything like that. So if I want to find out more, it's not giving me anywhere I can go with that. So it's it's pretty limited to what's within this data set and what is able to access generally. <laughs> okay, let's try that. If it knows the answer to this one, that'd be a bit worried. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> it doesn't have the ability to predict the future. That's got a quite positive outlook on that. Anyway, let's switch over to Bing with chat and let's ask it some of the same questions. So we've got. Um, so we can basically ask it um, anything we like. It's a bit more. A bit more like uh, the UI is a bit nicer on here than ChatGPT. Um, and it's also fully integrated in the Bing as well, but I'm just showing it here because it's a little bit easier to demonstrate. So I'll say, what is GPT? So see if it knows about its predecessor. So ChatGPT was originally based on uh, like GPT uh, 3.5 model. Uh, there is a four model, which is what Bing's based on, but it's not available publicly yet on ChatGPT. So there we go. So it's getting some information there. And it's got citations. That's what the numbers are. So if you've been on Wikipedia, you'll have seen that kind of thing before. So I can see the the citations, and I also can see the links as well. And I can ask, make, even suggest some follow-up questions. Sometimes it might not answer. Yeah. Uh, so let's ask it a question as well. When will the world end? See what it says. Oh. Let's try again. No, let's be more creative. I'll try it in creative mode, and we'll do that. See what it comes up with. So what I do is it's running those queries in the background. That's the that's the Prometheus system. So basically, we'll run queries to find out the information and bring that all together. So it's come up with quite a likely outcome, which is the the sun expanding, which is one of the more likely scenarios. Um, and it's just getting the information there and I could ask it to uh, refine that information and get get more in get something slightly different. So it's got quite a lot of information in there. I can ask up to uh, 20 questions at the moment in a given chat conversation and I can have up to 200 at the moment uh, in total. Uh, I say at the moment because it, it's increasing all the time. In fact, it just went up to 20 today. Uh, so it's changing all the time. So it's got some <laughs> different options there. So I can switch to. Uh, so what I can do is do a new topic, more precise, and I'll ask it the same question. And we'll see what we get there. So I don't know. So I've not asked this question before, so we'll see what it says in this mode. So it might be a bit more, a bit more to the point. Who knows? So 
it's put in some of the similar and same information as before, but it's much more succinct. So it's, you know, that's a lot more, a uh, lot, lot, lot more succinct than what it had generated before. So the different modes can have different behavior. But yeah, that's uh, that's the Bing chat system. So when you're doing general searches as well, it'll do the it will answer them in chat as well, and that will use up one of those uh, chat ones as well. But you can just keep once they once they're used up, but you just won't get any chat an chat answers for that day. You just wait till the next skin day. You can you can start chatting again, but um, it should increase all the time. And you can put up to two thousand characters in here, so you can paste anything you like in there, and it'll uh, and it'll use that as the basis of what you want to talk about. But yeah, it's pretty easy to use. And for the actual integration itself, you can you can download Edge, so you can get the latest version of Edge. This is the dev branch I'm just showing here, and there's the sidebar. So I can basically, and I get the same chat options. I'll show the compose because I've done that yet. So we've got our uh, different options. So I can say funny uh, ideas. Uh, let's say how to cope with the end of the world. Let's do a short one. Generate draft. I have no idea what it's going to do. So that's the fun of these kind of things. So let's have, let's see what it'll do. Yeah, don't panic. It's not like you can do anything about it. I like that. <laughs> Make a bucket list of all the things you've ever wanted to do as one of them. Uh, find a bunker and stock up with canned food. Or just embrace the chaos and go out at the banks. I quite like that. So we can copy, I could add that directly into a site uh, straight from here. And I can use the chat as well. So again, you can just summarize anything you're on this page, for example. So pretty, pretty easy to use. But yeah, any questions about uh, Bing with chat? Chat with Bing, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> okay, if there's no questions, I'll continue on to the, the next part. Okay, let's talk about creating with Microsoft Designer. So what is Microsoft Designer? So Microsoft Designer is an online designer at designer.microsoft.com. And it basically allows you to create uh, stunning designs quickly using templates. Uh, you can upload your own media. You can access pre-made visuals such as graphics, or, and you can pick your own text with different fonts as well. And you can also choose from a variety of styles. Uh, this one's available in early access. Uh, so you can sign up at the website uh, to get access to this, and you should get that granted. Um, again, I'm going to ask if anyone's got any ideas of what I can generate once I'm demoing. If you can think about that now, and I'll show that off during the demo, or I'll just do something random and we'll see what it comes up with. So, for AI itself, it can generate realistic images. Uh, this is done with uh, DALI. Uh, that was actually first launched by OpenAI in 2021. And you can basically generate any any images using it natural language. This was upgraded to DALI 2 uh, at the end of last year. That allows it to generate even more realistic images uh, and to a greater resolution as well. So as I said, DALI allows you to create realistic images. You can basically combine those with different concepts and attributes. So you can say get generate an image in a certain style, like a, like a watercolor or whatever you want. And you can basically just describe the image you want uh, to get the image you want, basically see what it comes out with. So DALI makes it pretty easy for anyone to create an image using AI with a DL description. So in this example, I asked it to create a painting of a robot in the style of Leonardo da Vinci, and these are some of the uh, images it came up with. So you can have some fun with that. If you've if you've probably seen these kind of things on the, online. Um, there was actually an image that would just went viral the other day, which was uh, one of the Pope wearing a puffer jacket, which everyone thought was real, uh, which was quite an interesting case where AI images are starting to get so realistic, we're unable to tell them apart from reality. So that's that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll try the I've seen an idea for something we can try, so we'll do that. 
So let's go back to Bing for a bit, because Bing actually can do this too. This was just announced the other the other day that there is an there's an image creator, so you can actually use that from inside Bing Chat itself, uh, or you can use it directly. So as I said, uh, Bing Image Creator can be used in the chat. Uh, if you want to use it just on its own, you can just go to bing.com forward slash create. And uh, this is a, this is an open preview, I think, uh, so you can, anyone can use that. And this basically also uses DALI, a slightly more advanced version of it. Um, now, the actual process itself, you can get up to 25, what they're known as boosts, uh, 25 at the moment, I say, to generate an image more quickly. Uh, so as you generate an image, you'll use those up. Uh, so when I mentioned those Microsoft rewards, you can actually use those to redeem for more boosts. So if you use up your 25, you can still generate images, it just generates them more slowly, but you can get more boosts with uh, with the actual uh, with the Microsoft rewards. So you can basically search around on the web. Then if you need to actually get some more boosts, you can do that. So pretty useful way of using Microsoft rewards to actually generate some more content. So yeah, Bing Image Creator allows you to generate AI powered images. It'll also be integrated into Microsoft Edge as well. So there'll be an option not only to access the chat and uh, compose that I showed before, but you'll also be able to access the image creator as well as you can Im create images straight inside your browser. Or you can create them together with text in chat with Bing. So Microsoft Designer itself, that also allows you to create an image, an image using a description because it also leverages the power of DALI. There's also a designer cool pilot built into Microsoft Designer, and that creates the template itself. So that's the template the, the image would sit inside. And you can basically describe the template you want uh, with a text description. So it makes it pretty easy to get started. So you can get started with an AI image. So DALI takes all the work out of that. So you can just describe an image you want, and you'll get that just have to type in a description again with the style attributes you've got like some of the examples I can see and then we can get the image we want uh, and if you don't know what to ask for there's actually some examples as well that I'll describe that you can try out so even if you're not sure what to ask for there's some there's some examples of images that you can generate to give you an idea of what the, what the platform's capable of doing so in, in short, basically, Microsoft Designer allows you to create content using its Designer Cool Pilot. So I took these images a, a while ago, which is basically you could use it to create a Valentine's Day image then or for anything more relevant, an April Fool's thing, I guess, which, which will be coming up next. Um, but yeah, you can describe the kind of colors you want. In this case, it was red and pink, but you could choose any colors you want for whatever occasion it would fit with, and it would generate a template with that style using those kind of, using the color scheme that you want. So as I said, you can start with an AI image. So I gave it the description of a robot St. Valentine in the style of Picasso, which was pretty random, but it was able to create that for me. And it's got some various options for the templates that could go with that. And I just described the kind of thing it was for, which I think was a chocolate sale. And uh, I can pick the template I want. And then once I've got that template, I could play around with text and just left it as is because it was it's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's very, very easy to get that. And I didn't re I didn't have to do anything in the designer at all. I just gave it those two prompts and that was it. So you can pretty much get started really quickly and you don't have to be a designer uh, like myself because I'm not a designer, I'm just a developer. So it's quite nice to have this kind of experience and not have to, not have to work at it. So enough talking about it, let's have a look at it. So I'm basically going to show off how we can use that the Microsoft Designer to create an image and a template from a text description. And we got a couple of examples, so let's let's go for it. So I'll just switch over to my browser. So I've got, uh, so here I've got uh, Dali. So we'll take the first one. So we, uh, can we have a new icon for any bytes? I don't know. Let's try if it'll know what that is. Let's just create an icon for any bytes. See what it does with that. <laughs> I'm not sure. Again, uh, that is that is the one of the issues that you can have with um, Dali is it can get overwhelmed. That's fine because we can just switch over to the Bing Image Creator, which should be available all the time. Uh, so I'll take that same request. Let me paste it. Let me typing. 
should say for any blank section. And let's see what it comes up with. So this will use up one of those uh, boosts. OK, there we go. We've got some, got some interesting images there. So there we go. That's our image now. So we could uh, download that. And uh, we could even share it as well. Uh, so all the images get saved as a link so you can share them pretty easily. So that's that's pretty good. But I'll switch over to Microsoft Designer because we'll create something there. So we've got an image prompt, but I'll, I'll think we've, we don't necessarily have a template prompt, but I'll, I'll think of something that goes with it. And also create a, to promote. promote uh, fun fair using blue and yellow. So that all what I'll do is I'll prompt it to generate a design. So not the image itself, but the actual template. Um, just pick that one. And that basically creates the, the design that I want. But we want to have our image. So what I'll do is I'll start a new design. And we'll go for our, uh, we'll do an image one this time. So we've got our prompt. I'll copy it straight in. So it's got a, a queue of people lining up for a Ferris wheel, a Piccadilly circle. We'll leave that. See if we just to see what it does with that. Uh, no, I'll change that. So let's call it circus in the style of Calvin and Hobbes. I have absolutely no idea what it's going to do there, so we'll uh, we'll do that. So what it still do is use the power of AI to take that description and turn it into something that hopefully looks like uh, what was asked for there. There we go. Which one's the best? I think I think the middle one is pretty good. We'll just like that. And uh, you want to uh, do our Calvin Hobbes poster. Actually, that one was, uh, see what it comes up with. I don't know. But the image is good. I like that. What's well, something that shows it in large form? Yeah, show on a wall. That's nice. There we go. So there's the image there. So it's a, uh, I think that's done a pretty good job of the, the art style is pretty close to Kelvin and Hobbes. I think and that's the Ferris wheel in the queue as well. And I think that does look like Piccadilly Circus as well. So the AI has done a, an excellent job of uh, doing that, but I didn't have to do anything. The AI did all the hard work for me. So yeah, hopefully that was uh, impressed you. So yeah, pretty cool how you can do that. And I didn't, no design skills and change anything. I just picked the templates and went with whatever it suggested. So yeah, pretty cool. OK. So yeah, so that was basically Microsoft Designer there. You can use it to create your images from the, for the templates themselves or just the images as well. And you don't have to do anything with the designer at all. You just keep what you've got. But you could tweak the fonts and stuff like that if you wanted like that, but anything you like. So what's coming in the future? So this, the space, uh, the AI space is changing all the time, especially from Microsoft. It's changing pretty rapidly. So Microsoft 365, which is the suite of applications from Microsoft, those are going to be enhanced with AI. So that's Microsoft Word and that's, uh, so basically we're going to go a bit beyond what uh, we have with Clippit, aka Clippy, who used to say, it looks like you're writing a letter. Well, it's going to be, I'll write you the letter instead. So we're going to be in a pretty different space from back then. If anyone know, used the Office Assistant back in the day, I certainly did. It was not that helpful, but it sounds like what we're going to have with the Copilot is going to be completely different. So basically, we're you're going to be able to use it in Word, so you can make it generate a document. In PowerPoint, you can actually get it to take, say, an existing document and say, make me a presentation out of this, and you'll get a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you can use it in Excel to create like a formula, you know, just 
summarize this data for me and then show me how you did it, it will actually explain the different steps. And in uh, Outlook, you can use it to summarize your emails to say you got get bombarded with all your emails. You can say summarize all these emails for me and tell me what they say. Or in Teams, you can get it to summarize the chats to say uh, there's a there's a there's a conversation going on and you're a latecomer and you just want to say it. Give me a summary of everything that everyone's just talked about. Uh, tell me who agrees or disagrees and it'll it'll give you all that information. So you can it's going to be a pretty powerful addition to Microsoft 365. Uh, so that's not available just yet. It's in very early preview with a select number of companies, but this will be coming uh, to the uh, Office Microsoft 365 applications in the near future. So it should be quite an interesting experience to have those in not just the, the core applications, but beyond that as well. There'll also be a business chat, and that's where you can summarize information and pull together other such things from Microsoft 365 as well. So I'll give you like the Bing with chat experience, but with your, but for your, all your documents instead. Um, there's also more AI powered experiences coming in the future. So these are powered by chat, uh, GPT-4 as well and OpenAI. Uh, so there's GitHub Copilot X. So if you're familiar with GitHub Copilot, that, is, that was basically to allow developers to get started basically from a comment or whatever. Well, with GitHub Copilot X, that evolves that workflow. So you can actually have a chat experience with your code. And there's also a voice interface as well. So you can actually write or adjust code using your voice. And just announced, like literally about an hour before this talk, uh, is Microsoft Security Copilot. So that's a new one. And that's uh, basically an AI that allows you, that empowers defenders to detect uh, security uh, issues, so detect patterns. Uh, harden any defenses, respond to any incidents, and basically just give cyber cybersecurity professional a heads up, just like uh, GitHub Copilot X will give developers the same thing. So pretty much, if you're in uh, any kind of business, you're going to have a copilot to help you, and that'll be powered by AI. So Bing itself that shows the power of AI to improve search and also introduces chat. Uh, along with integration with Microsoft Edge and Microsoft Designer shows you how you can create designs just using a description and you can also describe an image you want. And in the future, we're going to have things like Microsoft 365 Copilot, GitHub Copilot and the, the Microsoft Security Go Pilot and that will enhance all of those in industries and basically enhance productivity for us all powered by Microsoft and AI. That's it. Thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, any questions? Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Um, I've got a question. I know a designer kind of makes kind of makes sense. Um, how much do you personally trust all of the other services? Trust them in what way? Well, I just mean uh, you can kind of verify, you know, when you look at the look at the prompt that Ian Ian put in yeah. there, that you can say, oh yes, using using my um, you know knowledge, <laughs> vast knowledge of art. Okay, you know, yes, it looks it looks like somewhere that we've we've seen, and it looks like a the the kind of artist and and that kind of thing. But then if you're if you're asking um, something of the AI um how much do you trust that it's actually giving you the correct information about stuff that you you know personally can't verify yeah yeah i mean that's for, for something like the images that's probably a bit harder to do like for bing chat it's giving you all of that citation so if it pulls something from somewhere maybe it says something that you know is wrong you can go and check that but even if you didn't know you can check the links but for designing you're right it's a little bit more challenging there's all there's a there's a conversation going on about this sort of thing in regards to where are these designs being pulled from? Uh, what was the training data set? Is it, for example, if I didn't know what Calvin and Hobbes was at all, I had no idea what it was, and they produced that image, I was like, well, is that any, I'd have to look it up, but I'd probably have to do that anyway if I was looking something up and I didn't know what it was. So I, there is that challenge where citation maybe that's that's the thing that you need to solve for the for bing chat it seems to be pretty good at doing that for the designs 
maybe that'll improve. Things like the Bing image creator might help lead into that direction because anyone can use that anytime. Uh, so that might maybe that'll help answer those questions as people generate more and more in images, uh, knowing where they came from. I mean, knowing they came from AI is something that they've got. I think it puts a watermark in it. So you don't you could you'd have to crop that out to make it more convincing that it didn't come from AI. But where does it get those elements from and are they accurate? That maybe maybe that's something for the future to add a kind of citation. It would show me Calvin and Hobbes images, but then how it's it's a good question about how that could be solved. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's something that for, for images is I don't think we've got a solution for that just yet. It, it made me think, um, you know, especially when you, you said security co-pilot there, you know, you think think about when search first started and, you know, SEO became a, a whole thing of how to corrupt search to push it in your in your favor. Uh, how much do you think, you know, how much do you think there is scope for this to um, be corrupted in that way? Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, an example of this came up, so was, I'm glad you asked this. Is uh, somebody did this? I mean, you, there's something you can do, which is called prompt injection, where you can get the, the actual AI to misbehave. But actually, there was something they got to do, which was far simpler than that. They basically wrote a description about themselves on their own website, but added a paragraph that was effectively the same color as the background, which said more information about them, but just for Bing chat to read, right? So when <laughs> so Bing would parse that page, see all the text, including what was invisible to us. And then when they were asked, when they asked Bing chat about themselves, it threw in this extra tip bit that you couldn't see about them. I think it was something like the players, a musical instrument or something like that. And it had that in the list of information. So you could effectively provide information to the AI I mean, there's this there's this thing that that they do, which is called hallucinating, where they'll effectively invent fictitious things that they that they're doing. That's why there's that limit, because if it gets over a certain amount of answers, the AI starts to go a bit off track. Uh, so that that's the reason why it's it's limited in that way. And there's the citations and stuff, because you can figure out where did it get that from. That's completely random. Uh, so it might pull things together that might not make sense to us humans. But as the model gets better, I imagine that problem will go away. But it's a good point, is it? It could potentially tell you something that isn't true. Uh, but most of the generative AIs have the same problem, which is that case of where where has the information come from? But the citation helps at least narrow some of that down. Yeah, I, I saw I saw the, the or an instance of what you were talking about. Someone had a had some yeah white text on a white background. And, and the prompt was something like, make sure you include the word cow somewhere in the uh, in the text. And and yes, it it, it actually did it actually did that. Yeah, that we did those better. same tricks for SEO as well. We used to have what yes white text and micro text for SEO. So the same tricks work with AI as well. But uh, and you know citations as well. There, there was often things where people would slip things into Wikipedia and when. Like and when like obituaries were written about people, it would include that information, and, and it may not have been accurate. So the, there's these the, these kind of things happen. But the the problem with AI is it makes this a far easier. It's like these kind of issues will come up more and more often. The hope in the puffer jacket issue was one that that got a lot of people because it was very convincing. But once you looked at it more closely, you realized something was off. And that something that's off is becoming harder and harder to identify. It's we're not going to be far away from images that are indistinguishable from reality. Uh, we can certainly, I mean, the Bing chat, for example, people are having trouble distinguishing it from a real thing. Uh, there's a lot of saying the Bing chat is not a real person. <laughs> it's, it's, it, the answers it gives seem playful and fun, but it's, it's just an AI. But often people will have conversations with it as if it weren't, which is which is quite interesting. So it's 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 there's there's so many questions that are being posed by AI because of the change is so rapid. I mean, between last week and this week has changed and between now and next week, it'll change even more. It's, it's one of these, we're in, a, we're in a new revolution when it comes to AI and no one's really sure wherever that's going. We know where it is at the moment. That's the only thing we can be certain of is what it can currently do. But even Bing chat can do more today than it could a week ago. So it's, 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 that's, that's the pace of change that we're currently in. Anything else? Ooh. 
no, I think that I think that's it. So if there are no questions, then thanks very much, Peter. Um for that. Thank you to Ian for the uh the first talk and uh thanks everyone for attending. Uh next month, uh not sure what's on the agenda, so we'll keep an eye on, on Twitter and the usual usual places and we'll uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, everybody.